FTs today, but there is a fundamental need to in, understand a little bit more behind them. So I've put together some essential information and I know that it's helped. I've run it by a few people and, it, and uh, it's helped them to, to kind of get the gist of what's going on here. So this all starts with blockchain and blockchain honestly was initially formed way back in 1979. So it's, it's a series of blocks of data that are chained together. And in 2008, what happened was those blocks became distributed, right? The technology gave us the opportunity to have these blocks of data that are chained or attached to each other cryptographically, and they can be on any computer anywhere. So that's the kind of um, challenging thing about blockchain is to really begin to understand that data is distributed across many, many platforms and anybody who wants to become a part of the blockchain can become a part of the blockchain. So there's no exclusions for it. So it differs from typical databases because we use cryptography. That cryptography is also what helps us to maintain high levels of security in our data. New data is entered into a fresh block. It's filled with data and once it's filled, it's chained to the previous block. And so that places the data in chronological order and the data is what we call immutable uh, or non-fungible is another word for it. it. It will be there forever. It can never be edited. It can never be um, deleted. It exists in the blockchain and the blockchain is essentially, if you think about an accounting ledger, you would never go back and delete something from an accounting ledger because all of the transactions are part of the financial history of an organization. So the blockchain is, you can think of it in that way. It's a ledger for transactions. No single body, no government, no bank, no anything has control over the blockchain. It is collectively controlled by all of the members of the blockchain. Um, and as I said, the data is immutable. So the transactions are irreversible. Now, blockchain providers, the ones we hear the most about, um, Bitcoin and Ethereum, openly available to anyone that wants to take part in that blockchain. Then there's some blockchain as a service type companies. So these should not be surprising that you see IBM in here, you see Oracle in here, you see Microsoft in here. So these are companies that are providing blockchain services for organizations. So you and I would never just go out and get ourselves an IBM blockchain account. We would, our companies would, would keep these accounts and you know could use blockchain, for example, for our accounting ledgers. So I'm gonna provide you with a few definitions that are gonna get us to the point of really understanding what Bitcoin and Ethereum have done because they're the ones we're gonna focus on. So a peer-to-peer -peer network basically is a way to connect parties and it can be anyone, right? You and I can, can be part of a peer-to-peer -peer network. So it offers services like payment processing. We can get information about buyers and sellers and quality assurance. We can deal with quality assurance. So peer-to-peer -peer networks are critical to blockchain because that's how we distribute our blocks. Then we have these decentralized applications. So they're digital applications. They run on a blockchain, which exists in a peer-to-peer -peer network. And there, again, there is no single authority that oversees anything on the blockchain. They are sort of jointly um, overseen by all of the members of the blockchain. Now, what that means is we, we have the ability to safeguard user privacy, but there is a lack of censorship. Um, lack of censorship, you can look at in, in two ways. One way is, um, and we don't mean censorship so much as looking at content that might be um, you know, considered sexual content or something like that. What we mean is that anybody can say anything, you know, produce anything, and it is out there. So it, there's a broad range of people that are contributing, and there can be some things that are going to be objectionable to different people for different reasons. Um, and 
There is generally with these D apps, there's a potential issue with an inability to scale them. So that means if more and more uh, users might be uh, engaged in a particular app, it might make it difficult to scale. So these are problems that some of the, the um, blockchain providers have actually tried to assist with. Okay, now cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency is not in dollars and cryptocurrency values float every day. So Bitcoin and ETH. So Bitcoin is obviously the, the Bitcoin currency. It's known as BTC. And ETH, ETH, is the currency that Ethereum uses. So these currencies are not backed by anything tangible. They have a figurative value based on the fact that other people assign them value, right? And they're traded through uh, consenting parties. And essentially, if you have any cryptocurrency, you would keep it in your crypto wallet. Okay, and a crypto wallet uh, keeps passwords and uh, recovery phrases private. Um, they allow you to send and receive cryptocurrencies and you could actually have a USB stick that is your cryptocurrency wallet, or you can use mobile apps for it, or you can maintain your cryptocurrency online. So we have, there, I've, I've listed the top 10 cryptocurrency wallets here, but there's recently been some rankings. So the wallets, I, I have some notes on here that the Coinbase wallet has been ranked as number one all around and it's noted as being the best for beginners. So if somebody is stepping into this world, it's a less complicated way to step into this world. The Electrum crypto wallet is best for Bitcoin. So users of Bitcoin, the Exodus crypto wallet is best for a desktop wallet. Ledger Nano X crypto wallet is best for offline usage. And then um, Mycelium crypto wallet is best for mobile. That's, that's the ratings. And, I'm, I'm mainly providing this to give you um, some options that are out there. I should also point out that MetaMask is actually a very popular wallet, though it hasn't necessarily been ranked uh, as high as some of the others. It is a very popular wallet for people who are just getting started and it's a fairly easy to use wallet. DeFi, our next definition, decentralized finance. So it removes third parties from financial transactions like banks, right? You can, your financial transactions are decentralized into the blockchain. You use the security on the blockchain and we, we use what are called stable coins, okay? Stable coins. The BTC is a stable coin, ETH is a stable coin. So it allows us to transact business and transfer funds through uh, this decentralized network. Smart contracts are self-executing contracts that have are, are established between a buyer and seller. Um, they're written into the code of, of, the, um, of the blockchain. So the blockchain started kind of with the Bitcoin world, right? Where um, it was mainly about cryptocurrency. But as it evolved, in particular, Ethereum was the one that, that started designing these smart contracts because Ethereum uh, does more than cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is still um, singularly focused on cryptocurrency. So this is actually code that's written in and Ethereum makes all their code open source, right? So people can keep adding to it. And that's why these smart contracts work. So think about it. You know, when museums are, are evaluating the provenance of an, a piece of art, they follow the, the transaction of that piece of art through time. So these smart track contracts actually facilitate that sort of provenance that could be associated with um, tokens that are on the blockchain. So let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin in detail. We'll talk a little about Ethereum in detail, and then we'll look at what makes them different. So first of all, Bitcoin, there is around 19 million Bitcoins in circulation. Okay, so again, operates free of any central control. And you'll see that I say this a number of times in the presentation. That's because this is the key, distributed data, distributed control. So 
everything is worth what the collective body says it's worth. And that's uh, exhilarating and deeply frightening. So, um, so we rely that we rely on cryptography to keep our bitcoins peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, and it is public. So it's a public ledger that records all of the Bitcoin transactions, um, and copies of this are held on servers all around the world. Again, we said that the consensus is reached uh, across the nodes, and the transactions are publicly broadcasted and shared from node to node. So what happens is the transactions that occur. So if we go out and we buy Bitcoin, that transaction is collected by miners. So it, people that are thinking about this, you know, um, maybe years ago when all this first started to come into play, we heard a lot about mining Bitcoins, right? So the transactions are collected by miners and every few minutes, the transactions are recorded to the blockchain. So that is how the Bitcoin retains its value because each time transactions occur, those transactions are what work to stabilize the value of the coins. Now, they can be subdivided to seven decimal places. So a thousandth of a Bitcoin is known as a milli, a hundredth of a, a hundred millionth of a Bitcoin is known as a Satoshi. And of course, we can then ultimately exchange them for cash. So now I want to go back and point out around 19 million Bitcoins in circulation around 120 million ETH in circulation right now. Now, Ethereum is known for its cryptocurrency, the ETH, and it also, as I said, was the creator of the smart contracts and applications, the dApps that exist. Bitcoin doesn't have any of the dApps, so Ethereum was built to be able to sustain all of these things. And again, transactions are collected by miners and they're put into blocks every few seconds. So Ethereum is a much faster process. And if you ever go out to buy cryptocurrency or purchase a token of any kind, you'll find that unlike transactions that we're accustomed to seeing on computers, where we see them to being almost instantaneous, there is going to be a delay. And that delay is part of the fact that, that everything is being mined and added to the blockchain. So it'll be faster at some times of day as opposed to other times of day. Um, so Ethereum, like I said, it's a network of decentralized apps, the dApps. They originated the smart contracts and it's an open community and their purpose is to find a way for creators to earn online worldwide. So consider for a moment Communities of artists, uh, and this has been one of the things that's been in the news, communities of artists in Africa who have been unable to take their art artwork and distribute the physical artwork and earn a living from it. But by building these tokens, these NFTs that, that we're going to talk about in detail, they have been able to actually earn sustainable livings through their artwork. This is an amazing thing, right? The, the starving artist can suddenly become someone who is able to sustain and do the work that is their passion. So it's a, it's a pretty great thing. Um, decentralized finance, the DeFi, uh, allows equitable access, but keep in mind it's equitable access with an internet connection. So if you don't have an internet connection, the access is not so equitable. So it does, you know, there's a little bit of a hitch there. Anything that you can own can be represented as a token. And again, non-fungible just means it is unique. So anything that we can own can be represented as a non-fungible token. Now that means there's something physical we can own that we can tokenize or uh, digital artwork. For example, we've been working, so at St. Joseph's University and Janine Guerra is on this session as well. We have been working with Angela to help artists to create NFTs of their artwork to be displayed in a virtual gallery so that you could physically, well, not physically, you could figuratively walk around a gallery and view all of their artwork in a setting that feels very real. And we can, we can talk a little bit more about that later, but it's, there's, there's this opportunity and that artwork we're talking about is digital. But then there's all kinds of other, there's music, there's um, 
videos, there's things that are non-fungible tokens that we would look at and say, hmm, that doesn't really look like something that an adult would put together. There's a lot of sort of odd looking stuff, but the general idea is anything that we can own, we can tokenize. Think about baseball cards. For years and years, baseball cards have been the thing. The Topps company has distributed baseball cards with sticks of gum. And if you had a Babe Ruth rookie card, you, you were in the money. Those baseball cards have been tokenized. Now, here's the tricky part. When it's tokenized, it means that you own this space in memory. Other people can see images of the same thing that you own, but you own it. So we may see that there's a thousand images of the Babe Ruth rookie card all over the internet, and you can look at it, you can download it, you can share it, but you don't own it. There will be one owner or maybe a group of people that will be the owner. So this is what Ethereum uh, provided for us that exceeds what Bitcoin has put into the world. And they're actually going to be um, offering incentives to people that own ETH so that, you know, the more you own, obviously, the more incentives you get. Now, let's look at them relative to each other. For cryptocurrency, Bitcoin has about 50% of the market. And I looked up the value of a Bitcoin just before our presentation. Are you ready? $35,588. One Bitcoin is worth that much. That's why we can distill it down to seven decimal places. If we get down to seven decimal places, it's still not cheap. Um, and one of the reasons why Bitcoin retains its value so effectively is that they have a limit. So currently, I told you back here, there's about 19 million Bitcoin in circulation. Bitcoin's limit is 21 million. When they get to 21 million, they will issue no more Bitcoin. Well, and that's what they say right now. So we'll see what happens. Ethereum has about 25% of the market in cryptocurrency and Ethereum is second only to Bitcoin. So these are the top two cryptocurrency providers. One ETH a few minutes before we went, we went live is worth $2,346 today. Now I can tell you that I was looking at a, a, an NFT that I was considering purchasing last week and one ETH was worth $3,500. So the value floats and it's part of the process of becoming capable in this, in this world is making sure that you're paying attention to these floating values and getting the best deal that you can. Um, all right, so Bitcoin, they originated the cryptocurrency, right? And it's a medium of exchange and a way to store value. Ethereum are now using the, the blockchain for other purposes, like I said, that include DeFi, smart contracts, and NFTs. So the difference between them is this piece that Ethereum has added. And when Ethereum began, they were intending to complement Bitcoin, but it turned out that their cryptocurrency took on enough of a life of its own that now they're also competing with Bitcoin. So you can buy and sell any of these tokens or work in any of these smart contracts or DeFi using Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain. So there is a, a handshake between them. All right, so now let's talk specifically about non-fungible tokens. Cryptographic tokens cannot be replicated, will always and forever exist on the blockchain. Now, here's kind of the funny thing about NFTs, and I'm telling you a story of something that I did. I, um, I had started a collection of NFTs, and because my daughter's dog is the most photographed creature on earth, I thought, well, I'm just going to use these pictures of my daughter's dog. And I created my collection of NFTs. Uh, my computer uh, restarted itself, and I was not careful. I didn't keep my recovery phrase. I mean, I saved it somewhere. I just don't know where. Uh, I didn't keep my recovery phrase. And now those NFTs are forever embedded in the blockchain. I have no access to them. No one has any access to them. So some of the space in the blockchain is just wasted space because if we don't keep track of it, we lose it. So most NFTs are part of the Ethereum blockchain. 
uh, though other blockchain providers can certainly implement their own version. So the phrase NFT is an Ethereum phrase. And like I said, artwork, music, sports memorabilia, eBooks, real estate. People are selling real estate, tokenizing real estate on the blockchain. So it allows these memory locations to be owned, bought and sold, and the value of them can increase in, in ways that are almost insane. Um, there's other things we can do with NFTs, but I wanted to first show you some of the most popular NFTs uh, and Angela, I will share these slides with you because I know all these links are in here if anybody wants to look at them. But I mentioned Tops, so Major League Baseball and Tops are working together. They've NFT baseball cards. Um, they're Gronk. This is Gronkowski. It's uh, his greatest moments in sports that he's tokenizing and selling to people. Now, anything that he's tokenizing could be something that you can watch on YouTube, but through uh, his NFTs, you can own it. So, and that's meaningful to people. But let's talk about some weird things. Crypto punks, they're pixelized images of, they almost look like little people's faces that were made of Legos. Bored Ape Yacht Club, they're pictures of, of apes that are doing various things. Uh, we have a colleague whose son bought a, a bored ape when they first came out for $1,000. And to date, the value of his board ape is $400,000. And it's a picture of an ape. So like getting this all into my brain took months, let me tell you, because I, I really, I kept saying, why, why would I value a picture of an ape at $400,000? But you kind of have to think about it like stock. It's, it's an intangible thing and it goes up and down in value based on people's perceptions of the value of a company. So interesting, but I wanted to particularly point out the lucky goat. The lucky goat is actually a way to use NFTs for charitable purposes. So when you buy a lucky goat NFT, Heifer International gives goats to people that, that they serve. So Heifer International is an organization that, that basically provides um, the resources for people to begin to um, sustain themselves more effectively. And I'm gonna stop my share and change it to a different share so that I can actually go to the Lucky Goat website. So in this case, there's the goat, right? It's cute. And right now you can buy a goat for 0 0.0777 ETH. So you can essentially go in and mint a goat. And then if we scroll down, you'll see we donate real goats when you purchase a lucky goat. So it is a way to use NFTs for, for charitable purposes, which I have to say is, I love this. I love this approach to it. It makes it feel a little bit more like something uh, real, tangible that matters. And you know, Ginny, I just want to jump in. I think I think yesterday when we looked at this, they were sold out as well. Oh, the lucky goats were. Yeah, and so it looks like they're back in stock again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and these doodles, bored apes, and this Beeple's Every Day's Oceanfront. There are no more of these. The only, or there's no more of these that are fresh, I should say. The only way you can purchase them is through exchanges like OpenSea, and then you're buying them at market value. So it's very much uh, like the stock market. It has its risks, it has its rewards. And the more you get into NFTs, the more you become someone who is able to get the initial public offerings, they're actually called IPOs when there's gonna be an NFT collection produced. The IPOs, if you are someone that is in the know or you have the street cred of owning a board ape, for example, that like in the NFT world, if you own a board ape, like you are cool, like at the top of the heap. 
Um, if that's the case, you'll get early notification of IPOs and you'll be able to do pre-sales. So it is something that when people get deeply into it is incredibly um, monetarily rewarding. Now, the problem with, with Ethereum is that every time you make a purchase, there's something called a gas fee. And the gas fees can be up to 20, 25% of your purchase. So the cost of your NFTs increases substantially due to these gas fees. So these side chains have been created and they've been created by different organizations. Um, and so the majority of the NFT community is on the Ethereum blockchain, but it's inefficient, it's extremely expensive to transact on. So side chains provide a solution. So there are side chains that are attached to the Ethereum blockchain. And some of the, the biggest um, artists and brands are taking advantage of this to be able to decrease the cost of publishing and minting these NFTs. So they offer increased efficiency, substantially reduced fees, and they bridge to Ethereum if you want to bridge. And so the reason that that matters is you can create your NFT on the side chain. When you bridge it to Ethereum, then you get the access of the Ethereum uh, sites, any site that sells. Um, that sells NFTs on Ethereum. You still end up when you bridge, you still have to pay those gas fees, unfortunately, but at least you can mint and actually place yourself in a good position with these side chains. So I just have a couple side chains to go through quickly. There's the Palm side chain, quick throughput, low gas fees, 99% more efficient than the system used by blockchain. Proof of work is the name of the, the system type that's used by Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, good option for collectors and creators. They make easier, they make NFTs easier, more efficient. And it was just for your information, these are the people that formed it. The Loom network alt chain. Okay, now I said side chain, some of them call themselves alt chains. This one was started in 2018, and this one was scaled for high performance. So back when I said to you that Ethereum had some scaling issues, the Loom sidechain is trying to resolve those scaling issues by the way that they develop their own chain. Okay, so uh, you can onboard users without that delay that comes from having to wait for everything to be mined to be placed on Ethereum and then your transaction comes through. Uh, so, and then you can also integrate assets from all of the major chains. So, so this is great, right? Here's the bad news. Um, they shut down without warning, temporarily. Just And when they did, everything that was created there was lost. So these, no matter how great the things turn out to be, there's still a level of risk involved. Um, the XDI sidechain, that uses a proof of state mechanism instead of proof of work, which is, is really not a, a terribly relevant thing, but primarily what you focus on with XDI is they have a native cryptocurrency and their native cryptocurrency is pegged to the US dollar. So they have stability in their cryptocurrency that it does not exist. Bitcoin and ETH are not pegged to anything. So the, the value of XDI is we always know that one XDI is worth $1. Uh, XDI has its own separate network. So um, other stable coins operate on Ethereum, XDAI has its own separate network. So if we're gonna mint NFTs, first of all, just as there were open blockchains and, and other blockchains that are more focused on blockchain as a service, the same thing happens here where there is OpenSea, Rarible and Mintable are three apps where anybody can mint anything they want to. And in fact, OpenSea, if you mint a single copy of an NFT, you can mint your NFT for free. So anybody can do this. A seven-year-old can do this, right? Because you can mint it for free. Now, if you're trying to create a supply of more than one, if you're an artist that wants numbered, uh, numbered tokens, then there is a fee. But if you're creating only one, it's free. Now, there's some other spaces that are that you have to apply for. So acceptance is required. And they do this because they want to keep the spam down 
and the quality high. So think back about how I lost some, some NFTs. They're trying to kind of create integrity around this. So there's Makerspace, Super Rare, Async Art, and so on. Now let's look at some NFTs that have been minted using these side chains uh, just because there's some cool things about them. For, so for example, um, there is something called the currency created by Damien Hurst. And the currency is on the Henny platform, which is a, a, a good platform, a high quality platform. But if you look at the post here, so he um, in, initially minted a collection of 10,000 NFTs. Well, they correlate to 10,000 actual physical pieces of artwork. So if you look at this post, the exchange window is now open and you're able to exchange your NFT for the physical artwork using the exchange process on our website. So this is someone who's been able to gain some traction from his NFTs and is now able to exchange them for the physical pieces of artwork and gets to distribute his artwork. So that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, Candy Digital uses the Palm side chain. So again, some pretty big players here. And the, this is all sports memorabilia. And you can, so one of the things about NFTs is if you are a collector of NFTs, often there's some incentive attached to creating a whole collection. So for example, if you um, purchased NFTs of all the players on a particular university basketball team, and once you got that collection for that, that player year, uh, you might get a free season ticket to the basketball games, right? So NFTs, the more you collect them, the more you're incented to collect them. So for example, this, this is um, Candy Digital offers incentives like throwing the first pitch at, an, at a major league baseball game of your favorite team. So these side chains are not only pretty efficient, but they're, they're leveraging ways to bring together the digital, the, you know, the virtual with the physical. Um, the plasma bears, I wanted to bring them up because this was something that became very popular. It became, it was a social game. People played together. They collected bear parts. Um, they could win prizes. The bears went on ventures and the, all that is great. And it's on the Loom network side chain, except that when the side chain went down, everybody lost their bears. So that's, that's the risk factor. So that's the uh, cautionary tale. The last one, the XDI side chain, this one is pretty cool because it does things at, at a low cost. And there's something called proof of attendance protocols. Okay, and these proof of attendance protocols can be created at a very low cost. And in fact, I don't know if Nefertari, um, she had another event, so I don't know if she was able to make it here, but Nefertari Strickland is actually using these proof of attendance protocols in a class that she's teaching to, to badge basically the students so that by the end of the class, you know, they will have all their POAPs that they're using um, to, as part of their credentials. So not only are they attending her blockchain class, but they are achieving certain um, badging or certification because of it. So this, this um, XDI sidechain provides this again, this ability to mint these at, at a low cost. Now also think about if you're a, a band, okay? You're, and Kings of Leon is one of the bands that does a lot with NFTs. But what if you got an NFT every time you purchased a ticket, right? And you got these um, proof of attendance protocols for every concert, then you could again be up for, you know, they could offer you a backstage pass or things like that. So the proof of attendance protocols have a lot of really interesting uses as well as their collectivity or the collectability. All right, so I'm given the time frame. The next time we meet, we're actually going to do a tutorial and we're going to take you through creation of an NFT, but we don't actually have the time to do that at this point. So I wanted to really just open up for questions and comments at this point. Hey, Jenny, there was a question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if the person who posted it wants to unmute and speak, but it was about 
um, some use cases, I think, around the tokenization of real estate, for example. Um, please feel free to hop on. So this is one of the, the less, uh, this one lacks clarity, right? Because tokenization of real estate, um, the theory would be that the place you own is also the place you own the token to, right? But they're not physically tied. So if somebody has an amazing estate and they tokenize it, uh, you can basically own that tokenized version of that property. Um, much like, unlike the others where there seems to be a, a pretty direct um, connection that could be achieved between the token and the real estate, this one can have a connection or it can not have a connection. So what, what do you exactly tokenize? The, the coordinates, uh, a 3D model? It could be, it wouldn't be the coordinates. It could be, it's all digital, right? So whatever it is, it's digital. So it could be a digital rendering. It could be a digital, it could be a photo of the 3D model. It could be a photo of the physical, uh, you know, house or whatever it is. Um, but that's the trick, right? It is a digital rendering of something attached to that house. So let's think about it like a Frank Lloyd Wright house, right? They're sort of publicly open, anybody can go in and tour, but the, the people that run the Frank Lloyd Wright houses could sell us a token that is, you know, one of the Frank Lloyd Wright houses and that in and of itself could become a valuable piece of art. Could you think of it like a souvenir kind of? And for lesser valued, you could absolutely think of it like a souvenir. Oh, and we have um, a comment that I am aware of the platform uh, creating NFTs with no gas fee. It's, it's could I ask, um, is it, but when you go to sell it, is there not a gas fee? Plus there are gas fees associated with the purchase of the cryptocurrency. So that's, that's where the issues come in. But if, if you've been able to do that, um, let us know. Hi, yes, this is Lawrence. I think you were referring to voice.com. Yes. And uh, at least as a creator, because for me it was uh, um, something I was not ready to do is like to mint an artwork and pay upfront quite a bit about amount of money plus having to buy crypto, whereas on voice. So I figure it, on voice, there is no such things and um, collectors can pay in dollars, but I, I figure it's because it's an alt platform as you were alt chain, as you were alt saying. Chain. And, and OpenSea lets you create NFTs at no cost as well. So, um, thanks Janine for the article. Janine posted a link to an article on NFTs in real estate. Oddly enough on fool.com. Um, able to speak? I got an article here on uh, Associated Press starting its own NFT marketplace for photojournalism. So they have a, a whole history of very famous photos that the journalists have taken over the years. And on January 31st, they're going to launch an NFT collection. And the proceeds are going to help fund the association and the photographers are getting the share of it. Um, pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and I don't know if, if you guys watch the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I know this was, you know, a couple months ago, but at the start of the parade, they announced that they had a collection of 20,000 NFTs of historic Macy's balloons that were available free so that they gave a website and they were gone within seconds. Um, it's amazing the organizations that are becoming involved in NFTs. I like, Michael, I like that idea that Associated Press is doing that. Yeah, I think it's great because it's not just um, <laughs> bored, bored apes, those little yes. <laughs> graphics. I, I think they're very childish. It's not, not that interesting to me. But, but real photographs, because that's, I do for photography, um, that I think would be very cool. Um, and so it is already digital. So you post a, an image to Instagram or any place 
anybody can copy it and download it so this way you will have a digital image but now it can be tracked right and it can be sold right. so i think yeah. that's a huge revolution it's amazing. yep i agree mia you asked how the students are getting involved i'll, I'll explain in a little more detail janine is actually running this competition for us uh, and she will certainly fill in any gaps that I missed. But essentially what we're doing is we've gone out to high schools in the Philadelphia area, and we have engaged teams in a student competition where they're doing two things. The first thing they're doing is they are minting a piece of art for an artist that Angela, um, Angela recruited artists for us. So they're gonna mint a piece of art for the artist that the artist will then own and be able to um, be able to display and use however they want to use it. The second piece of the competition is the students are actually doing data visualization using Tableau software. Tableau is a data visualization tool for dashboarding. And the, the data set that they're using is a, a data set on uh, sales of NFTs over the last, Janine can tell us what period of time. So the, the service that the students are doing, and it's a, it's a small piece of what they're doing, but it gives us the opportunity to engage them in something that is valuable, right? They're, they're um, tokenizing artwork for people that don't necessarily at this point know how to tokenize it themselves. And they're gonna use the OpenSea platform where it's free to mint it. And then as soon as the, the artists have access to it, they can begin to, they can post in a gallery, they can sell, they can, you know, just hold in their hands, whatever they want to do with it. And just to jump in there too, hi, this is Janine. Um, just a couple of the questions that I've gotten from a number of the artists, as well as from some of the students. So I, I just want to, I guess, go over some of those, because my guess is that a lot of them actually have the same questions as well. So the students aren't actually going to be creating the artwork. So the, the, the artists, you all are actually going to be creating your artwork. And so that's why we're asking for that JPEG, GIF, you know, whatever it might be, um, so that we can actually get that to the student teams. You're going to maintain complete control over your art. So we don't take ownership of that. We're not going to be selling the NFT or anything like that. So, but the students need the piece of artwork which we're going to get to in the next session, um, but in order to actually do the minting and get that piece of artwork actually on the blockchain, it's actually a fairly simple process. I hadn't done it myself before. And after, um, you know, speaking with Jimmy and, you know, getting a little bit more clarity on the directions, it took me about maybe 15 minutes max um, to do it. So it's not, it's not a terribly difficult process once you actually get into it, but the students do need the piece of artwork. Um, and again, that can be an animated piece of artwork, it could be a video, it could be an audio file, it could be a photo of a physical piece of artwork, it could be a digitally rendered piece of artwork. I mean, really the possibilities are endless. I mean, if you looked at the Gronkowski example, I mean, there's, there's some of them are videos of his place, you know, so. Um, <laughs> So and, there's and a lot of saying who cares. <laughs> right. And so there's a lot of different options for that. But um, but the artwork is coming from you all as the artists. So the students aren't really going to be involved in the artwork creation piece of it. What they're going to be doing is then taking your artwork and getting it on the blockchain, getting it minted for you. So that then what's going to happen is they're gonna turn it over to you. So that way you can, if you wanna put it out there for sale, you certainly could do that. Um, if you want it to take part in the um, digital exposition that's gonna be set up, you could certainly do that. Um, you can actually set up royalties so that once you sell it the first time, if you know what, if it gets to be viral, um, for example, and it, it gets bought and sold and bought and sold a bunch of times, you actually get um, a royalty fee that you would set up for that. So, which is actually one of the nice features, <laughs> because when a piece of art, a physical piece of art, is sold, the artist doesn't get right. those additional royalties. So, one of the nice features of this, you know, sort of chain of knowledge is is the ability for an artist to continue to benefit even though they might have originally sold their piece of art for a small amount of money. Right. And so that that's why I've been emailing a number of you to say, hey, if you want to change your artwork, because the students actually do need that piece in order to move forward, because they actually have to upload the file onto OpenSea in order to get the minting done. 
So I hope that answers the question. Can I ask a question? How do I do that? You like the, what you just did. Okay, great. <laughs> so one of the things I noticed is, <clears throat> first of all, with NFTs, you, the artist or creator, may be able to attach an actual physical dimension for the NFT. In other words, I make an NFT, it's virtual. If I want to, I can also attach a physical thing to it if you buy it, right? The NFT yes. process. Oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. So the NFT process that I've seen so far requires that in order to uh, become part of this, like such as Voice.com, you need to provide them certain amount of, um, of validity about who you are, that you're not a money launderer that's wanted by someone internationally, and so you provide things such as your Social Security or credit card or bank or whatever. Uh, is this true across the board with all the NFT? No, I'll tell you that OpenSea, um, there's very little personal information that is collected by OpenSea. Okay. This, I, this other source doesn't really require um, any fees. They do, voice.com does charge you uh, a small commission if you sell it. And if you do it in a um, edition, then you would take, they would take a percentage, which is very small compared to the the gallery world. Right. Uh, but again, there is no nothing but this virtual image of the thing you make. And it's so essentially what happens is when you create the NFT, you create it with characteristics. And one of the characteristics might be it comes with this physical piece of art. And that that is something you can do. And that's, um, you know, the, the example I showed you, the side chain example where, you know, he's exchanging them for the physical piece of art. Now, when he exchanges it, he's getting the NFT back. So he's getting the value of that NFT back. Um, so that's how he's sort of pushing his, uh, his income stream, I'm gonna say, and his work forward. But um, NFTs can be configured in whatever way you want them to be. And the, the platform OpenSea even lets you say, hey, here's some characteristics. And in the description, you can say, when you purchase this NFT, this is, um, this is what you get. I think we've got a hand raised um, from, from Blue. I don't know if they have a question. I did see that there's an article that was posted about a Beeple hack. Uh, collector losses of more than $2 million of NFTs overnight. Uh, and there's some crazy, there's some crazy NFT values as well. Like I, I did, and I'll, I was going to show it next time, but the most expensive NFT has sold for $92 million so far. Like it's just crazy. And, and Janine, you were talking about uh, somebody who lost a, a billion dollars in Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I heard a, um, a story on the news, maybe over the summer or so, um, where it was a millionaire out in Cal or billionaire out in California who had a lot of money in cryptocurrency, but they could not find, they had put it on a piece of paper somewhere, whatever the key code was, that's like a gibberish code. And they needed that to actually access the wallet. I mean, it's not something that you could guess and they could not find it anywhere. And they were like, hey, it's just gone. You know, there was no way to recover it, which um, I was saying, I think I would cry. <laughs> I, I would definitely cry. Um, I also see too, um, I'm not sure if it's Jonna or Jonah. Um, I'm not sure how you say it, but I see a hand raised there as well. So I don't know if she has a question. Hi, it's Jonna. Um, so Similar to the Board Ape Yacht Club, I have a project that I'm working on and there is a website, it's called nftgenerator.art and you can pay like, I think it's 179 for a hundred then it goes up if it's whatever and whatever. And I think it's like a thousand for 10,000 to be minted. Um, but then am I also paying a fee to upload it to the platform as well? Like, I'm not sure if when I'm minting, is minting and uploading it to an OpenSea or Solana blockchain or whatever else, two different processes? Or am I, when I'm paying that, is that, 
you get what I'm asking? Am I paying twice? So, um, so because you're creating multiple, right? Multiple of, I'm assuming multiple of the same piece of art? No, um, they're all different characters. It's, okay. it's a lot to explain, but um, layers, they're layered art. So you can select the rarity of what you would want for each individual character similar. So like, all right, for the Board of Yacht Club, some of them have cheetah skin and that might be 5% rarity X, Y, and Z. But um, when they uploaded those 10,000, were they paying one like large fee or was that fee covered when they minted, when they created them on that platform? So what you're being charged is to mint them. Okay, gotcha. so to create them essentially. So when we mint, we create them. Now comes the part where you go to sell them. And when you go to sell them, that's when additional fees may come into play. But right now, if you have minted them, they exist. Um, you, can, you can place them onto whatever platform you want to to sell them. And um, if you were simply going to place them onto a platform for people to view, there would be no more cost. But the, the time that the costs, the additional costs build in is during the, the sale. Gotcha. So I would want to mint them before I post them to a website. Yes. Or Instagram or anything. Correct. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think Blue has their hand raised again. I'm not sure. Um, okay. There Hi, we go. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I First, I have problems with my computer. The second, the, that that was some emergency in my apartment. Um, <clears throat> thank you for noticing me. And thank you for a great presentation. I um, I understand that this is mostly practical uh, workshop, but is it possible that I ask more philosophical question? Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Then you see. <clears throat> uh, so could you a little bit tell about how much uh, NFTs and the the whole crypto industry invest in climate change oh so this is a great question and actually one of the things that we're going to discuss in our next section session okay. because here's the deal um the cost of the equipment to maintain the blockchain is actually substantial and it has a, a non-negative carbon footprint so yeah it's a problem and what companies are starting to do is they're not able to directly offset the cost of um, the environmental impact of the blockchain. But what companies are doing is they're doing parallel work to contribute positively to the environment, right? So even though um, their, their carbon footprint is positive with the blockchain, they're seeking other ways to make their carbon pr footprint negative so they can reach a neutral standpoint. But you're absolutely correct. This is a very big thing. Okay, and the next question is, um, so uh, what do you think, how it the whole situation uh, could affect mental health and gambling habits of the society whole because it seems like it's uh, it seems like it's making this attempt to make um gamblers from everyone including artists which were really concerned about climate about this and about that and now they are seduced in these nfts and stop probably care and how it's uh, generally affect mental health of people situation like this so i i can tell you that you know we talk about some of these very expensive nfts but most nfts actually sell for less than 200 dollars. so your point if people get in their head you know that they're going to uh, go out and become rich because they're going to start trading in NFTs. Well, yeah, it can be problematic. And, you know, we've all seen the impact of, of too much virtual life and not enough personal life uh, through the last year and a half, two years. And, 
you know, I mean, that's my opinion, but I, I invite anyone to, to share. I, I've not read anything specifically about it, but, you know, I think this is, I think this is a, uh, a great opportunity for many, many people, and it's also a very scary thing. Yeah, I think I would add to, to me, um, it seems very, very similar to, for example, like a credit card, right? So it's really, really easy to go to the store and start swiping your credit card because in your head, you're not actually paying money, right? You're like, oh, it's, I'm just swiping the credit card. I'm not actually uh, spending the money until it actually comes to pay for it. So I think when you're looking at the prices on some of these things, I think it's really easy for your brain to trick you because you're seeing like 0.007, right? And like Jenny said, one, it was actually, what was it like $3,000, something like that. So that 0.007, if we're translating it to real dollars, it's not less than one cent, right? It's actually potentially hundreds of dollars. And I think, I think that's the thing to keep in mind is that in the end, this could translate then to real money. Um, it's not just kind of play monopoly money sort of stuff. And I think that's something that maybe a lot of people either don't understand or they do understand, but then again, kind of their brain tricks them when they actually see the prices. And it's not, it's not secured by anything, right? There's no, there's only the agreement of a lot of people on the blockchain who guarantee the value of the, the currency. That's, that's potentially dangerous. Um, one last question um, from me. I, I do have to go in like two seconds, but if if someone was to put on a project and they make some money and then they withdraw it, right? Um, no, it's not stolen from them, but they're still heavily taxed. Uh, correct. All right. They're, they're going to be taxed, taxed on anything they make. Yeah. Not so. What is the point? Uh, but so, um, how do you actually get? some income or money then. Right, so, but it's much like if you produce a physical piece of artwork, right? You're, and you sell it, you're still gonna be taxed on it. I don't think you're I, getting- I don't. Well, I, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> someone, <laughs> an artist yeah. who sells a piece of their work has, is asked to declare that, legally is, is required to declare that to the IRS and they pay tax on it. I don't think that the taxes are, beyond like the taxes that are associated with what you make are just associated they're based on your tax bracket right so you're not losing everything to taxes you're losing that portion that you lose to taxes all the time Thank you. um Thank so you. I'm, i apologize i don't remember your first name donnegan you were muted when you were trying to speak you're still muted We're, there you go. Well, I got, I definitely was following <clears throat> the last conversation. Um, you know, the issue of just selling the work would be great. Paying taxes, sure, take some taxes. If you're buying my work, you can take taxes. I, I'll pay a commission. I mean, it's, it's the nature of, of moving products in this world anyway. You don't make money on anything free. Uh, you have to invest something. I mean, the only thing that I see that's really risky for people here is those that buy NFTs. To make an NFT, if you're working through one of these sites that doesn't charge anything, you could make 10,000 NFTs, put them all up on one of these free sites if they have such a place. And until something actually, you know, you have to really do what gallerists do, which is basically to, to beat the ground and get people in, to go in that direction and then buy these. And then, you know, it all begins in terms of costs for anybody. And, and actually producing art and selling it as NFTs, the royalties are limited. Where galleries take higher royalties, you can actually control the royalties a little more. I mean, you're still going to pay them, but it's a little bit better for you. Thank you, Jenny and, and Janine. It looks like we're at six o'clock, and so we'll have to have to stop here. It's a very exciting conversation and there will be a part two session um, coming up. So everyone, thanks for attending and look out for that. Um, we're gonna change sessions now in just a moment. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Angela.
Thanks, Jenny. This was awesome. You have so much knowledge that I'm going to have to watch that recording like four